Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning, and I'm glad you had a time of fellowship today. Uh, we continue our series in the book of James. Before we do so, I want to bring your attention once again. Awana, uh, we're having a great turnout for Awanas on Sunday nights, and that'll be again tonight at 4 o'clock. Uh, also, D-Life groups, uh, we're meeting on Wednesday night, and we have we kind of meet in a large group, and then we break up in small groups, uh, round tables, and we still would love to have you involved if you're interested in being a part of the discipleship group. And our hope is that those will expand into the community as well. So this is a great place to start. And then also, uh, kids worship. Uh, we're starting a new ministry for kids during worship time, October 13th. And uh, we will be uh, having that uh, opportunity for those who would like to lead. You can sign up for that out in the Welcome Center. And then also on October 6th, we'll be having our service at the fair uh, in the stable building on the fairgrounds on uh, October 6th at 1030. There will also be uh, a cookout after that as well, but I hope you will join us in that opportunity. We'll not have Sunday school on that day but we will gather for worship at 10.30. So looking forward to that time. So if you didn't get enough of the fair, you get another opportunity on October 6th. Yeehaw. <laughs> Bob's excited about that. But uh, today, as I said, we continue our series in the book of James, and we're looking at responding to the Word of God in James 1, 19-27. Now, if I were to have a book, uh, bike up here and you were to see it, you were to see the bike, you can even sit on it, you can pretend to ride the bike, but unless you pedal the bike, you will not have any physical benefit from that bike's bicycle. That it takes us to get on the bike and to begin to pedal in order to experience the adventure of biking. Uh, many of you probably enjoyed biking over the years and love going to different parts of the trails that you have an opportunity to do. But unless you get on that bike, unless you begin to pedal that bike, you'll never experience what the adventures have for you on that bicycle. And the same is true when it comes to God's Word. You know, we can read the Word of God, we can discuss it, we can gain understanding, but we'll never get the full understanding and we'll not receive the full transformation until we put that Word into practice, until our faith is put into action. So just like a bicycle, we have to put some action into it to get the full adventure from it. The same is true in our faith, that we want to put action in our faith in order to gain the transformation that God wants to do in our life. You know, it's said that in our culture, information is abundant, but transformation is rare. We have a lot of podcasts, there are a lot of sermons, there are a lot of books on spiritual growth. But often these, this information does not lead to real change in people's life. They know all about the Word of God. They know, they've heard about it. They've listened about it. But they have not put it into practice in their daily life. So the purpose of Scripture is that we would be doers of the Word. The purpose of Scripture that would transform us into the people of God that He wants us to be. And so as we hear the Word of God and we study it and we put it into practice, we put our pedals in action then we begin to see God doing the transformation in our lives through his word. So James challenges believers to move beyond just hearing the word of God and reflecting on God's word, but he encourages us to put that word into action on a daily basis. So if you'll turn to me to James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27, we'll read this together. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, you can underline, or underline that word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. 
But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Let us pray. Father, as we open up your word this morning, we pray that James will speak to us once again, that we would gain a full understanding of as we know the word and as we hear the word and as we study the word, the Lord, we would put this word into action in our life. Lord, we pray that we would be doers of the word, not just hearers only. Father, we know that you desire to bring transformation in our lives. You desire that the word would go deep into us and be planted deep in us, that we may truly hear it, but also live it out in our daily lives so that we may become more like Christ and be transformed into his likeness daily. So Lord, we pray that you would come. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would fill us with understanding that we may truly put to practice what you teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we see here in the book of James in chapter 1, it shows us how to respond. First of all, in James 1, 1 through 12, we looked at how to respond to trials. And we learned from that that we are to persevere in trials so that we may go to, get to the finish line and accomplish what God desires for us. Last week, we looked at how we are to respond to temptation and to realize that temptation does not come from God, but temptation comes from within our own desires. And we should respond to that in that way. But also, today we're looking at how do we respond to the truth of God's Word? How do we put the truth of God's Word into action? So today we're going to look at three ways to respond to the Word. As we've already seen there in verse 21, 22, and 23, it mentions the Word over and over again. And you can underline that. You can circle the Word that appears Because what James wants us to look at is how do we respond to the word in our life? How do we respond to that in our daily life and in our actions? First of all, we learn that we listen humbly to the word of God. You know, God wants us to not only read it, but he wants us to listen. He wants us to really grasp what the word of God has for us, to understand it. And so in verse 19 through 21 again, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. You ever have a problem with that? You ever have a problem of being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger? And it goes on to say, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of man or God, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we first realize that we're instructed to receive the word humbly as it's planted within us. And he goes on to say that we are to be quick to hear. You know, you ever heard the saying, why did God give us two ears and one mouth? You know, we should listen twice as much as we speak. So we need to be quick to hear what God speaks to us and understand it. And oftentimes the Bible points out that the value of listening to others, the value of listening to God. In Proverbs 18, 13, it says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame. So if we speak without clearly hearing, if we speak without clearly understanding what someone else may be saying or what the Word of God says, we we can then speak in folly and shame. We do not totally understand the situation. So listening is a key point of gaining understanding of a person or a situation. We want to listen to their perspectives. We want to listen to God's perspectives. And what does the word of God say to us? So if we listen, then anger will not follow. We will not speak without knowledge. So we need to be listening and aware of things around us. You know, how many of you notice that we live in a world where everyone is talking but no one is listening? 
We have a lot of voices, don't we? Whether that's on the news or on social media or on Facebook or whatever you're listening to or watching, there's a lot of people who have an opinion who are talking, but few of us are listening to learn from the circumstances or to learn from God. And so oftentimes, because few are listening and a lot of talking, there's anger, there's arguments, there's outrage that you hear often in the news and on social media. It's, it's constant these days. You know, especially in the election season, there's a lot of opinions, aren't there? And it's easy to get stirred up with those opinions. It's easy for us to not just listen, but to speak and to become angry. And it fire, we want to fire back and let our emotions take control before we know it. And that's where we need to take this to heart. We need to, what, be quick to hear. We need to take time to listen. We need to take time to understand what God desires in this situation. Not just someone else's opinion, but what God's word speaks about in this situation. So we are called to be different. We are called more than just speaking our mind, but we're called to listen and respond to God's wisdom in our daily life. So listening is an act of humility. It's hard to do because listening, what I'm saying is that you matter and your thoughts matter enough for me to stop and listen to you. You know, so listening is an act of humility. It's especially to God's word, listening to God's word is an act of humility because I'm saying God... Your points and your message and your word is more important than what I think. And so I must humble myself and listen to the word of God. Be quick to listen. And we want to respect and love others that we're listening to as well as God's word. So he says be quick to listen, but what also, what does he say there? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. You know, James urges us, that we should use our words carefully because words hold power in them. Proverbs 10, 19 warns, when words are many, transgression is not lacking. You know, we can speak without listening and it can lead us into difficulty. It can lead us into challenge things that are not true. So we all have opinions and believe, believe it's important that we express those opinions. Sometimes we lose sight of the people we're speaking with and we just want to express our political views and, or we just, want to become, we just want to argue about it and we want to find ways to overcome them and, and so that I get my point across. But God's word says, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Don't be one that just speaks at the spur of the moment, but let God speak to you. Gain his wisdom, gain his understanding before you begin to speak on matters related to whatever it might be, but also related to spiritual matters, we want God's word to transform how we speak. But also, he says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and what? Slow to anger. You see, anger, when it's unchecked, can lead to destructive behavior. When we just speak at the moment and we become angry about it, it's easy for us to say some things against someone else or or harm someone else by our words. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 reminds us, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. You know, that was, that's always been good counsel when I think about married couples. You know, do not let the sun go down on your anger. You know, before you go to bed, Before you lay down your head, if there's been some words said that have been harmful or hurtful, do not go to bed in anger. But he says there, do not not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. So we need to resolve things quickly when anger has been expressed, when we haven't listened, when we've spoken without thinking in that matter. And it's true within the Word of God. The Word of God says, that anger is not of God. In James 1.20 it says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. You know, but I, my anger is in, you know, is righteous anger. I have a right to say it. Well, Scripture says that anger of a man does not produce righteousness of God. It does not fulfill God's purpose for our life. So the fact of the matter is that James reminds us that anger may get our point across, but it doesn't accomplish 
what God wants in our life, which is his righteousness. What's the ultimate purpose of our life? That we'll be, that we'll be walking and speaking the image of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying here, be quick, to, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, because anger does not accomplish anything related to God's truth and God's righteousness. We need to be aware that our anger can take things out of control and away from what God desires. So anger can also lead to brokenness in families and relationships. You know, what, no matter what the topic is, we can allow anger to be expressed, and it truly can bring damage to our lives and our families. But ultimately, Scripture says anger does not accomplish any righteousness of God. It's not of the purpose of God. Now, you can be angry and what? Sin not. You can become angry, but you can control that anger by listening more, speaking less, and learning from the situation. So we can have anger in our life, but when it rises up, we realize, whoa, I need to stop. I need to listen. I need to speak less. And I need to learn from the situation and allow the Holy Spirit to move in me and transform me into what God wants. In Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, a familiar passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is anger, vengeance. Is that what the fruit of the Spirit is? No. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. You know, if we truly want the righteousness of Christ to be revealed in us, we want the fruit of the Spirit to flow in us and out of us. We want our life to not be full of just words and full of anger, but we want our life to be full of love and joy and peace with others and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. That, that definitely produces the righteousness of God. That definitely accomplishes what God desires because that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So the point is, God's purpose in our life is so that his word will transform our lives into his likeness. And our transformation should affect our interactions with others. So as God begins, God's word speaks to us, we realize it says be slow to speak or quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. And allow that to sink in and transform us into more what Christ desires. So we realize that we listen humbly to the word of God. We receive it humbly. We allow the word of God to go deep within us and begin to transform us. But also we consider what the word of God says. Look in James 1.21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, I think of the implanted word is that the seeds of the word of God has been planted deep within us. You know, as we know, the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, 1 through 9, the key of the soil was the, what produced the crop or the nature of the soil. You remember the parable of the sower, the, sow, the seeds were sown, and some fell along the path, which were hardened. And because they were, hadn't hardness, they would not produce any crop, would not be a tra- bring about transformation. Or it says that some seeds were thrown a- around the rocky soil, and there was not enough soil, not enough depth for that seed to take root. The implanted word could not take root because of that shallowness. And then he goes on to say there's a thorny, thorny ground, And this is the ground that's been choked by weeds and choked by worries and concerns of life. And so the word of God is not able to go deep in that person's life. But finally, he says there's a good soil, which has a death, which has been tilled. It's able to receive the seed, but also produce transformation. So I believe what James is saying here, we need to allow the word, the implanted word, to go deep into our life. We want it to produce a crop. We want the word of God to transform us into people of God. That we will be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, and allow the Holy Spirit's character and nature be revealed in us. So the successfulness of the seed in our life, the word of God, 
is the condition of the soil or the heart of our lives. Do we have a hardened heart toward what God wants? Or are, are we just worried and things are crowding it out that we're not able to trust the Word of God and allow it to go deep? So the heart condition is what determines how successful the Word of God is able to transform us. So when we are not quick to listen, and when we are not slow to speak or slow to anger, it will reveal the shallow ground of our life. If we're just spouting out off our mouth, we're not listening to other people, and we just become angry at every, every turn, it reveals there's something in our heart that needs to be transformed, that needs God's touch in our life. So we humbly receive God's word, and we humbly yield to his word. Look in verse 21. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness or humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I love the idea that you receive it, you yield to the word of God. You allow the word of God to go deep. You allow the word of God to produce transformation in your life. And you hear it and you receive it as a follower of Christ. Now I love the story of Samuel who was with Eli and he was waiting and he heard God speak. You remember in 1 Samuel 3, 8 through 10, Samuel had heard, heard, heard a voice and he heard God calling and he arose again the first time and he went to, he went to Eli and Eli said, go back to bed. He heard it a second time and Eli said, go back to bed and listen. But a third time, here's what it says. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time and he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. Then Eli received, perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant you know, I believe that's the imagery we see here in James chapter 1, 21. Receive with humility the implanted word. When God speaks, we receive it with humility. Just like Samuel said, speak for your servant hears. I am here. I'm listening. What do you desire? What do you want in my life? So when God speaks, a servant listens and conceives with humility. And he says, come, Lord, speak. I'm here. I want to receive what you have for me. So as we're reading God's word, as we're hearing God's word, we want it to go deep within our life. We want it to transform us. And so we, like, uh, like Samuel says, speak for your servant hears. Lord, I am here listening to what you want to say and how you want to transform my life. You know, the process looks like this. There's communication where we're listening to the word of God. And then there's a comprehension, understand what God says. This is what God's saying I want in your life. This is the characteristics I want in your life. Then there's confidence, we trust in what God says. And then ultimately it leads to change. God transforms us into the men and women he desires for us to be. So I think it's important that when we hear the word of God, when we read the word of God, that we will be like Samuel, that we would kneel down, And meekness, we bow down before God and say, Lord, I am reading this word, but Lord, I pray that you will speak to my heart. That your word will go deep and transform me into the person you want me to be. Say that with me. Speak for your servant hears. Speak for your servant hears. You know, that should be our natural response to God's word as we read it and as we hear it. That we would respond with that humility as he says there, James says in verse 21, receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You want your soul to be saved? You want to be transformed by Christ? And listen to him humbly and receive what he has. So our response to the word is that we should humbly listen. We should humbly consider what God is saying. But we should humbly yield to his leadership that will follow his lead. 
So that, that takes us on the first point. The second point is, how do we respond to God's Word? We remember constantly the Word of God. We do not forget what we have read. We do not forget what He has told us. Just like Samuel listened to God, speak for your servant here, and God spoke to him, and he followed those directions. He yielded to do those things. In James 1, through 25, it says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So that's a pretty common passage we hear. Be doers of the word, not just hearers. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law and law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So we want to be like a hearer who does not forget, but we are to be a doer who we act, we act on what God's told us. We act on what God has led us to do. And then look at the first part. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. You know, you kind of get the idea that, you know, you're looking into the, you're getting ready in the morning, you're looking at the mirror, you seem to have everything in the right place, and everything seems to be ready to go. Your hair is brushed, your teeth have been brushed, everything's ready. And then you begin to walk out the door and realize you still have your pajama bottoms on. You know, you forgot something important. And so that's kind of the imagery of what we see here. It's like a man who looks intently, and he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror, and then he walks away and forgets what he saw. You know, the one thing we should remember more than anything is our own face, <laughs> is our own, is our self. And so we want to remember what we see. So in the same way as we look intently at the Word of God, we want to remember what God says. We want to remember what He has told us and the instructions He has given us that we would not forget when we walk outside the house. We will not forget when we close the Word of God and when we've listened and we've read. We want to remember what it says, but also to put it into action so it can do its work in us and transform us. You know, what does it take to look intently in the Word of God? First of all, we carefully read. It's not just skimming, let me get through my Bible reading today. Glad that's over. And we leave and forget what we have read. But really, it's careful reading. We want to read the Word of God slowly and thoughtfully. What is God speaking to me? Lord, my, your servant is listening. We also want to take time for meditation. How does that Scripture relate to my life? How does the Scripture relate to my circumstances? We want to meditate on that. We want to study it. We want to get detailed information about the text. We want to figure out ways to apply the Word of God. How is the teaching of Scripture can be applied to my life and to my decisions and my relationship? And ultimately, we want to allow the Word of God to shape and transform our character into the likeness of Christ. That is when the Word of God is deeply planted, when it does the work in us. But what we want to do is not just be here, but we want to, we want to absorb all that the Word of God has for us. In John James 1.25, But the one who looks into perfect law the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So we look intently at the Word of God, we study it, we remember, we do not forget it, we absorb the Word of God, and it's kind of the image where I think if there's a, a bucket of water and you put a towel in that bucket of water and you soak it into that towel, and you, then you can pull it out and you can wring that water out, you know it's absorbed a lot of the water. In the same way, when we our lives are ringed out, when our life is being pressured, when we're going through challenges, what should be the overflow in our life? should be the Word of God. should be the character of God. And so we want to absorb the Word of God so that we can be doers of that Word and so it overflows into our life. And it shows, it's revealed when we're under pressure and when we're under challenging times. You know, I love the passage of Scripture when it talks about absorbing word saturation everywhere in our life. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, is a great picture of letting the Word of God absorb every part of your life. Let it saturate everywhere, every part of your life. 
Deuteronomy 6, 4-9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, his word. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be as a frontal between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Now, that's a great picture of how their, their house and their home and their life was saturated by the Word of God, by the law of God. They put it everywhere. They talked about it everywhere. So the Word of God was an important part of their life. And I think it's true for us as followers of Christ today. That when we listen intently to the Word of God and we share it together with, in our homes and as we lie down and as we walk and as we rise when the Word of God is part of every part of our life, then it will begin to transform us into what God desires. He says, it'll be even a sign on your hand, on the frontals between your eyes, you will write down the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Your whole life and your whole home is saturated by the Word of God. Now, you probably can think about some practical ways to do that. Uh, some people may write it on their hand. You know, how many of you are right remembering things on your hand? Don't forget to do this. My father-in-law used to do that all the time. He'd write on his hand so he wouldn't forget certain things. Well, oftentimes we can, um, Melanie and I would write down scripture or points of scripture on our mirror in our bedroom or in our bathroom and so that we can remember something and once again be reminded of daily. So find some ways to allow the word of God to saturate every part of your life. You know, put a card in your, in your car. Put a scripture in, in your office, wherever it might be that you can remember the Word of God. So we see here, we want to constantly remember the Word of God. And then the third way we respond <coughs> is that we live wholeheartedly the Word of God. We want the Word of God to be saturated all our actions and all our words. James 1, 26-27. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. You see, when it comes to the Word of God, our biggest problem is not reading it. Our biggest problem is not memorizing it or learning it or even knowing it. Our biggest problem is doing it implementation of scriptures in our daily life. So we see here the true test of our spiritual character is not how we receive the word, but how we apply it in our daily life. How do we do it? How do we live it out? How do we allow it to change our actions and change our decisions? Well, we want to put it into action. Verse 22 again, but be doers of the word, not hearers only. So there's two elements. We want to hear it and we want to do it. You know, I've, I've heard in, in nursing and a lot, of, a lot of degrees and a lot of teaching that in the principle is that you see one doing the task, you do the task yourself, and then you teach one to do the task. So it's not only knowing, but it's also putting into action. And that's true for any business, that's true for any activity. We want to see other people do it. We, then we do it ourselves. Then we teach others to do it. And so the key element in Bible study, key element of God's word, is that we'll take action, that we'll put it into action in our lives. So when we hear the word of God only and do not put it into practice within our lives, we will soon forget what the Lord has taught us. And like the man who stood in front of the mirror and walks away and he forgot what he saw. So in the same way, when we're reading the word of God and not putting it into action, we lose its meaning oftentimes. We lose its transformation in our lives. So when you hear something and you do it, that goes deep. At least that's the kind of learning I do. Uh, that's kind of learning, not just don't just tell me what to do, but show me how to do it. And then let me do it. So the same was true with the Word of God. It's not just telling us what to do, not just watching others do it, but then we put it into action and it really goes deep. 
I put my hands at the work that it calls me to do. So there's three expressions of faith that James gives us here as we close out. First of all, in verse 26, (coughs) he says that we should tame our tongue. If anyone thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So if the word of God is not going deep enough that our, our speech is different, then we need to be careful and learn that our religion is worthless that we want to put to practice in our life by taming our tongue. He also goes on in verse 27 that we would care for the needy. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. You know, all throughout Scripture, the, the Old Testament prophets and the minor prophets in the major prophets and also in the New Testament, we see that God calls us to respond to those in need. 1 John 3, 17 through 19, 1 John 3, 17 through 19, shows the response that we should have toward the need, the needs of others. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. In other words, as we hear the needs of others, what he's saying, little children, let us not love just in word and talk. Let us not talk about it. Let us just not tell them, I hope hope things work out for you. I'll pray for you. But also, he says, may we also work in deed and in truth. That we'll put the word in action when it comes to helping the needs. You know, he specifically mentions the orphans and widows. And the Bible contains several passages that, inf- that emphasize the caring of widows and orphans. <coughs> the reason is that they were the most vulnerable in this time. Because when your husband died... You had no authority. You may have the debt that was left behind, but you lose all the resources of the husband. So a lot of times your widows and orphans are the most vulnerable people in society, and that can be true even today, that their finances are a struggle, or they are without finances. And so we should respond as the Word of God says here. You know, other verses in Scripture that talk about the care of the widow and orphans, in Exodus 22, 22, 23, do not take advantage of the widow or the fatherless. If you do and they cry out to him, I will certainly hear their cry. And if you go on to read that verse, he says if you do, you're gonna, your, your wives and, and kids are going to be or widows and orphans. I mean, he's straightforward with that passage of Scripture. Also in Deuteronomy 10, 18, defend the cause of the fatherless and the widow and love the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And then in Psalm 68, 5, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. So we see here that James is pointing out that we not only want to know the truth of God's word, but we want to be transforming us personally and how we respond to the needs of others and do that especially to the widows and to the poor and to the the orphans. But finally, in verse 27, James says, keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, our life choices must be directed by our biblical understanding, not cultural norms. You know, we need to have a biblical worldview of the world around us. We need to not be stained by the world. We need to look at the world through God's, God's word and let that be the lens that we look at not to be allow the culture to determine. You know, we do not allow the, the norms of the culture to dictate what we believe. We do not allow the norms of culture to determine how we act or how we worship or how we serve. But we allow the Word of God as a biblical worldview. We see the world through the lens of God's Word. And that's where James is saying, keep yourself unstained by the world. Let the Word of God speak. Let the Word of God be your guide. In 1 John 2, 15-17, our final passage this morning, Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all is in the world he desires, <coughs> excuse me, of the flesh and desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You know, what the passage is saying here is do not allow the word of God to be your influence. Do not love the world, but love God. Love his word. Allow it to transform you in the things of God. And finally, how do we respond to the word? We choose to listen to God's word and others. We act on what we hear. We become doers of the word, and we do not forget what he has said. But finally, we love through action. We live out Christ's purpose in our homes, in our communities, in the world around us. You know, God wants us to be transformed by the word of God. And he wants us to listen to him and his direction. Let us pray. Fathers, we come before you. May we always remember to allow your word to transform us into the men and women you desire us to be. Lord, help us to listen and humbly respond. Lord, help us to look at the needs of others and to act. And Lord, help us to love others through the actions that we learn from your word. So God, direct each of us. I pray that your word today would transform us individually as we live our life from this day on.